I'm sitting here with Dom Flemons. Uh, so very happy to meet you in person. I've been a fan of your music for a long time. And we were just talking about your album, Prospect Hill. And another great thing about that album is that I probably would not have known that Hillsborough, North Carolina was once the capital of the state were it not for your record and your great liner notes. So another tip of the cap. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, and that album was very interesting in the way that we found a lot of different angles in which to present cultural history. Because nowadays, in 2020, people are, are much more conscious of the idea of evoking culture and how that can heal people. And, you know, evoking history or evoking a sense of, I guess, oneself, whatever that might mean culturally, especially in the United States. We have so many cultural elements that, when presented, there are so many things that can enrich our lives. And so at that time, um, I was working with Music Maker Relief Foundation and Timothy Duffy, um, who does a lot of the tintype photography for um, a lot of my work. And he um, was traveling around in Prospect Hill, North Carolina, and found this, this beautiful place, the Warren Store, which was this general store. It was just in a town where there was maybe to this day, I think there may be a hundred people in the town. It was just this gigantic general store, the house where the Warrens who owned the store lived, and then the post office, and that was really it. And as we began to get to know the Warren family, they told us this very multifaceted history of how the general store was not only a store, but it was a general meeting place, the House of Commerce, and then uh, Pat Warren, who is the descendant we talked to, mentioned that uh, Prospect Hill used to be the capital of North Carolina after it was in Eden, it, Edenton, North Carolina. So it was kind of the halfway point before it then centralized itself into Raleigh. So it was when Western Carolina, sort of the, well, when the middle Piedmont was the western part of North Carolina, that became the capital there. So it's, it was very interesting to start seeing a, a whole other side of the history that went beyond the music um, in one sense. but. In another sense, at the Warren store, they had a, a gigantic placard that was dedicated to um, uh, the Warren service as an RCA uh, Victor record distributor within the Warren store. So it had this sort of multi-layered idea of local history while being a conduit into the outside world. You know, they even had party lines that had three numbers for Roxborough and and uh, Hall River and stuff like that too. So they even had local party lines still on the on the wall from way back. Wow, you know, it, it's one of those moments where you're reminded that music and history is that kind of rabbit hole that tells you, uh, it, it makes you realize that you don't really uh, learn anything until you realize how little you already know. Absolutely, because music is entertainment. It can also just be taken at face value. You can hear a song, like a song, and really love it and walk away from it. But when it comes to a lot of the, uh, particularly with old time folk songs, they tend to, um, they, they have lasted the test of time in of themselves. And part of the reason is that they tell cultural stories that still resonate with people. And that's one of the things that I was always interested in. Um, back when I was uh, coming up in Arizona, I studied literature and English in college. And I was first drawn to folk songs by just the music itself. I just really liked how it was very exhilarating, especially when I heard like bluegrass music for the first time. It was so fast and frantic sounding, and it was really neat in that way. But then as I started to delve deeper into the literature of music and the way that music has been documented over a, a long period of time, whether in the folkloric sense or in the recorded sense and commercial or, you know, recordings from the Library of Congress, it, it just interested me and it took me deeper into the journey of culture. And then, of course, once I left Arizona and came out to North Carolina and the different parts of the country and the world as I toured, then I got to go to the physical locations of all these places. So then there was a there was a, a song, a name, a place, and a, and a culture to each of those places that was so um, distinctive. Um, like, I guess in a small way, you know, in the South, food is a, is a, a huge part of the culture. You know, for, like when I'm for in the West, if you were to say that we were going to have barbecue, barbecue could be a variety of food. But in North Carolina, I found that barbecue was a very specific type of pork-based um, vinegar based many times based on the region uh, sauced food that had a specific f 
flavor, purpose, and way that it was made. And, and, and music is the same type of way. It can, it can tell you about the region. It can tell you about the people that made the music. And that's something that has continued to keep me on the journey. And a lot of times people don't know why they're having a certain type of barbecue and it goes back so many generations that it's been lost. Same thing with music. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you'll find that many times if, and again, in the 21st century, we have so many more resources at our disposal when it comes to um, looking up the forensic evidence of <laughs> the records of, of a certain area now because it's all online. But just over years and years, it sometimes can take a long time to find the answers or be able to peel away the layers of culture to get to the answer of where there's a source. And uh, sometimes you can find it, other times uh, you're just you're left looking. And, and then other times, uh, I, I don't know, for me personally, in the past decade, I've seen a lot of new research come out that has just kind of opened my mind up to stories that I thought I knew very well. And so it's also really interesting to see um, the layers that can be um, um, revealed over time, you know. Um, yeah, like uh, when I was studying literature in college, they mentioned with Shakespeare, they said you should always revisit it every 10 years because every 10 years you have a different impression of all of the characters in any given play based on your own personal life experience. And I feel music is like that too. Sometimes a song as a as a younger person can mean something to you, but then as, as uh, you listen to it over time, it can mean something completely different based off of um, things the song is saying or sometimes the feeling that the song can give you as a person, you know. In those first days when you were getting excited about roots music, about uh, uh, bluegrass and whatnot, Sul Greg Wilson. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was really pivotal in your musical development. Can you tell us about him and about your time together? Oh, sure. Well, when I first uh, when I first met Sule Greg Wilson, it was an interesting sort of meeting. Um, when I first... So when I was in grade school, I started playing the drums. That was my first formal training. And I didn't start playing the guitar until I was uh, a junior in high school. And I began to start learning songs. So fast forward several years down the road. Um, I was part of the local folk scene in Phoenix, Arizona, and I used to play at the festival and was part of the coffee house scene. And so one week I happened to see Sule Greg Wilson. There weren't a lot of African American performers in the scene. And so when I met Sule, he performed with only a tambourine in his hand. He sang a beautiful um, spiritual number called Have You Got the Spirit, sort of a song to get everybody amped up. And he had a beautiful tambourine with a cross on it, was playing gospel tambourine. And after he performed that night. He came up to me and he told me about an event called the Black Banjo Gathering. And that was when I first uh, made my very first trek out to North Carolina was from Sule's invitation. And leading up to the gathering itself, Sule had collected quite a bit of information on African American string band music in his own research. And so he allowed me to look into his archives and spend some time listening to a lot of different recordings. And, and we talked a lot about the, the philosophical half of the music and and then after the gathering then after I moved out to North Carolina uh, he and I along with Rian and Giddens started a group called Sankofa Strings which was a, a group that was dedicated to um, I guess uh, showcasing the idea of African American string band music in the context of blues and jazz because there are a lot of stories that tend to intersect those type of music uh, genres and um, at the time string band music was something that was discussed briefly but it wasn't really delved uh, into in a in a uh, full scale sort of way at that time you know so it was still it's sort of a new idea to bring string band music into the blues and jazz realm so we did that first and after I moved out to North Carolina, Rena and I started a group with Justin Robinson called Sanco, uh, which was called Carolina Chocolate Drops, which was kind of the companion group, and we focused on the music of Joe Thompson, who was someone I met at the Black Banjo Gathering in 2005. And so we had these two groups going on. But Sule was really wonderful because he introduced me to the idea of Sankofa. And Sankofa is this beautiful West African proverb that means go back and fetch it, bring the things from the past into the present and into the future. And it's depicted by this little bird that's um, touching its beak to its back wing, representing the lessons it's taken into the future. So Sule taught me some musical things, of course, and, and exposed me to a lot of beautiful recordings. But there were a lot of interesting philosophical ideas through his experience of African drumming that, that he taught to me that I, I've applied to my approach to roots music in, in several different ways, in a more of a, I guess, an abstract way. because. 
you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, why do you do these songs that are 100 years old? And there's a power to doing that, to be, bringing these, these songs that from the past and bringing it into the present and then leading a new way into the future with this, um, you know, the, the stuff that makes our culture so strong. And so that's one of the things that um, Sule taught me early on. Wow. Can we talk about artists that you consider essential for fans or also players of Roots music and any songs that are foundational in your musical world? Oh boy. Well, I mean, there's. It matters what day you get me. There's a, there are a lot of songs that I could mention. I guess early on, I came across a record that really got me interested in old time music. It's called Old Time Music at Newport. And it was a beautiful little record of the Newport Folk Festival from 1963. And it featured some wonderful recordings of Doc Watson, um, Jeans Cottrell from West Virginia, uh, beautiful recordings of Clarence Ashley, Doc Boggs, um, and then also um, Gene Ritchie. And that was one of the things that really got me interested in thinking about old-time music as something different from bluegrass. Before that, I would just mention Flatt and Scruggs, the Monroe Brothers, the Blue Sky Boys, um, I mean, the Kentucky String Ticklers, the Teneva Ramblers, um, who were the string band that was, that was backing up Jimmy Rogers before Jimmy Rogers made records, and a great group there. Uh, Carter Brothers and Son, great, that's a great Mississippi group. The Mississippi Sheiks. Um, Martin Bogan and Armstrong, and also the Tennessee Chocolate Drops, is which is where the Chocolate Drops got got their name from. Let's see, um, Carl Martin, his solo recordings are really wonderful as well. Uh, Yank Rachel, Sonny Boy Williamson the uh, first. Those are some names I would mention of people that are um, kind of in the blues vein. Um, that are a bit more string band, a bit more folk based. Even Muddy Waters, there's a there are great recordings, the complete plantation recordings, where um, they are Alan Lomax's original field recordings of Muddy Waters, and he was actually in a string band at the time. And the lead player, Son Sims, uh, actually recorded with Charlie Patton. So there's this sort of interesting through line yeah. between Charlie Patton and Muddy Waters through this fiddler, and so it's kind of an interesting album in that way. But I could tell you a thousand songs. I mean, Rolling My Sweet Baby's Arms is one that I always re recommend to people. A song recorded during a hurricane, and and um, and it's a, has a frantic feel to it because it was, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a great. That's a that's a great song. Um, sitting on top of the world, lonely one in this town. I mean, I could go on all day about the about beautiful songs that have uh, influenced me at, at some point or another. I mean. Uh, your Baby Ain't Sweet Like Mine, that's a song I've played for years. That one's from Papa Charlie Jackson. And that's, a, that's one of the uh, influential uh, early uh, blues singers who actually plays a, a giant six-string banjo like the one I have on stage, Big Head Joe. And um, yeah, there's a whole, bunch of, a whole bunch of them. I have instruments that mean a lot, and I have songs that mean a lot, and stories that mean a lot too. Um, I've gotten nostalgic recently about Someone had asked me at one point why I tell so many stories in my songs, and the one of the people that got me started into doing that was the folk singer Dave Van Ronk. Mm. And I got to see him in concert when I was 18 in 2001 in Phoenix. And I just loved the format of how he told stories. It really just made songs more interesting to me. Songs that I was already interested in, like a, he performed like a, a song, You've Been a Good Old Wagon, an old Bessie Smith song that he made into a really wonderful version. But he told this beautiful story about meeting Clarence Williams and seeing Willie the Lion Smith early on in Brooklyn when he was a kid. And that type of stuff just, it just turned me on to the music in a different type of way because not only did I like the song, but again, time and place and people. And that started, connection, that through line. Exactly. It started turning into stories about people instead of it just being songs for the sake of it. Which again, songs can be good for the sake of it. Just in general, because songs are, are yeah. fun, you know? It's fun to listen to music and things, but yeah. when I started to get names and people and places and times and spaces for these songs and meanings behind some of the, even the words that they used or some of the phraseology um, or even some of the turns of phrases or something like that, that that people would say, just to learn about these things, I found it was an education of itself. Wow, yeah, it makes you think that it's so important how you experience the music as you've noted it the song 
in and of itself is can be taken at face value. And that's the way basically I grew up experiencing music was from the radio and I loved songs and I was I was drawn to them, but it wasn't until I started experiencing live music that it really got deep. Yeah. And I was hooked. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah it, you know, um, it, it's, it's one of those funny things, you know, like I, I didn't ever think I was going to be a professional musician until I saw that there was an opportunity to help expand the scholarship of, of old-timey music in a certain way, especially when I went to the gathering and saw that there were a lot of pieces that in the old-time school of thought, there were pieces of the blues school of thought and the jazz school of thought and the jug band school of thought that were things that I had observed as, a, again, as an African-American and Mexican-American person by, by heritage. I, I took notice of any stories when there happened to be stories of African-American people. And I noticed that there were, when I started to put them all together, they started to tell this very compelling story that was, that, um, uh, again, it, it empowered it. It empowered me in a certain way because it it, it showed me that African American people were involved with the birth of country music um, through history. It, it, you know more so than we've given them credit for. And there are many s stories where you find the pioneers of country music mentioning that there happened to be African American people around. And again, it's. Um, I'm always debating with people on this idea, like if you sing Will the Circle Be Unbroken, if we both know that the roots of Will the Circle Be Unbroken is in the black church, it's still a song rooted in the black church, whether a white singer or a black singer performs it. And that's one of the things that in recent years people are now taking into making this conversation into something that's in the forefront. But it's one of those things I noticed from the beginning that to know that there was, uh, even if country music is considered white music in certain regards, the fact that black gospel music or black folk song is within the spectrum of the repertoire it says something about the the entirety of the repertoire you know and then then to find stories of actual african-american players in there also um, just enrich the story more and of course I, I had 10 years of traveling around while there were still many of the old timers still around where um, I was able to meet them and and just ask them questions, and some of them just told me the stories. I didn't even have to ask. They, they expounded the stories upon me. Um, like the first time I played the Grand Ole Opry, uh, I was sitting next to a gentleman who proceeded to tell me about how in Louisiana, where he grew up, there were a lot of black string bands, and the whites and blacks played together all the time. And this fellow would tell me this every single time I went to the Opry, because um, for folks that aren't familiar with the stage, it, in the wings there's a small bench a small church pew that you can sit in the back and so this fellow would sit with me on the church pews every time he saw me and would tell me this and this fellow's name was Jimmy C. Newman and uh, I didn't know who he was the first time he had talked to me but after a while I then started to know who he was but then but every single time he would make a point to come over and tell me about the black string bands of Louisiana and how they would always play together and that's a, just those type of stories have fallen into my lap as well. Some I've looked out, looked for, and other ones have just fallen into my lap. Which um, again, get, it, it in its own way, it's sort of a, um, it, it's like the it's the elders uh, passing the baton on and saying, here's here's the story. Now you take it somewhere, wherever you take it, you know. And and so I've been, uh, I felt uh, enriched and empowered by that. And so I've I've tried to make sure to tell the story, whatever the story may be. Wow. You've said that we need to answer the question, why is country music white and why is blues black? Where are we now with answering that question? Well, you know, funny enough, in 2020, we still struggle with many of the same, the same uh, perceptions of what music should be. But this is one of the things about the categorization of music, is that it if for decades and decades everyone is being told music is defined by one characteristic or another, it's very hard to get them to open their eyes up to anything broader than what they've been told. And, and this is something that's not just a, a phenomenon in country music, this is also a phenomenon in blues or uh, hip hop or uh, any other type of music or even gospel music, they, they've had a big, um, they've had a big situation where they're, they're trying to uh, uh, to figure out if, if 
if gospel, if black gospel music is an appropriate term compared to southern gospel music, because these are all small terms that are synonymous with white and black. But in a world where socially we're trying to push forward into a world that is not white and black, if the music's defined by terms that were created in a black and white world, how do we overcome the the system that has already been created? And so. I think in 2020, I feel like there are new conversations that have been brought to the forefront. So I think we're just at the beginning of this. And I also think that in the 21st century, with it being a new, a new changeover in its own type of ways in so many different regards, I think that also the younger people that are coming up are now inheriting a history that at one point, I think before you had mass media on the scale that we have now, there was a certain point where history could be have taken place and it could have been pushed into the past. But with the access to information we have now, that's not as easy to do. And so there are a lot more um, people that are a lot more educated that are coming in, or they're more well-read, I'll say it that way. They're more well-read to where they're now asking questions where before I think they might not have asked as many questions about the way we talk about music or why does everybody look a certain way in a band or or anything like that. I, I think they're coming in with a whole new series of questions that before it was so well understood that things were a certain way that it just wasn't, it wasn't brought up in the particular ways that are being brought up right now. I think it's just a big changeover in terms of the mindsets. Yeah, I think people are more able to be conscious of those old habits or those molds that we've been forced into. Or the, That's right. The, whereas before, in ages past, people would always have that opportunity, but it might just be on the margins. That's right. It might be if you were just exceptional and really pursued this thing and, That's right. and could find the people and talk directly to them and... It, that didn't always happen. Yeah, absolutely. And then even with uh, many of the stories that I'm talking about here, a lot of, uh, well, it's been interesting now to see people coming in and asking me more about the, you know, they, they want to know more. Well, see, before, it, to talk about a, someone like Arnold Schultz, who was a, an African-American musician who was influential on Bill Monroe, we could talk about ben, Bill Monroe, and then we could talk about the story of Arnold Schultz as a side note. But now I found more people are wanting to hear the story of Arnold Schultz first, which is kind of hard because Arnold Schultz didn't make any recordings. And so to try to sidestep past Bill Monroe, who's such a pioneer of the field, to get to the story of Arnold Schultz, to me is kind of antithetical. I, you know, I'd, I'm a fan of Bill Monroe, so Arnold Schultz kind of in, makes me feel better about Bill Monroe's music instead of feeling worse about it. it that's how I am as a fan. I, I can listen to Bill Monroe knowing that he knew Arnold Schultz, and I feel no less about Bill Monroe's music because he was a, a fantastic musician, a beautiful performer, a great songwriter in his own right without this extra story. But it's been interesting to see that, that people are taking a different approach to things. I've always take, tried to take things at least with some sort of objective value where if, there are, if there's um, styles and, and, and stories that fit within the style, I, I wanted to work within that and just help help add extra stories that are within that instead of trying to go against it. But you know, when I make my music though, of course we're talking in great conjecture about um, the way that music's put together, but when I make my music, of course, I like it for it to speak for itself and I like for people to be able to hear it and hear all these flavors and subtleties and tones when they just hear it without me explaining it. You know, uh, uh, I just put a lot of thought into it before I make it, but when it's being made, it's uh, it, it, it's its own type of uh, excitement that um, goes beyond the words, you know. Hmm. Are you conscious of your own influence in helping to shape this culture? Uh, sometimes, you know, I've, when you take it all away, I'm, I'm a fan of music that always wanted to find more music. And so, at the end of the day, whether I've been influential or not, I'm still looking for my music and still searching out the searches I was, I've been searching out for the past two decades, trying to find that new sound, that new music, and make that new song that can move the peg forward in whatever way it might be. Um, it's been interesting to see now that, now that I'm getting a, a bit older now, I'm no longer the fresh new face on the scene. I like that. I, I like that in a way, because after a while you kind of get sick of being the fresh new face on the scene. 
And so it's kind of nice to also see younger people coming out, being their own type of musicians and really doing their own thing with it. You know, like for me, I've always taken that approach of taking a more traditional approach because I've I found that when people can at least see traditional music performed, they can at least go with that wherever they want to go. And so I've always, I, l I like going into the esoteric forms of uh, traditional music and I, I, I feel like that's my way of turning people's minds on to a different world of music, you know, just um, when they see the quills or the bones or even when they hear Big Head Joe, the giant six string banjo, these are, these are instruments that are very different sounding and looking than their normal guitars or normal banjos. So in a certain way also I try to be influential by, by visually giving people something different to look at. And this is part of my, my vaudevillian experience to um, in, in bringing that to the stage as well which is a, another part of the... The showmanship. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the quills and the bones. And the bones look like they're a lot of fun to play. Are they difficult? Well, they can be difficult. They're like riding a bike. It's difficult in the same type of way, where you have to really sit down and practice and practice and practice, and then one day it'll, it'll click in your mind that, it, uh, that, that you can make the sound on it. Uh, when I first came out to North Carolina, I went to the Mount Airy Fiddlers Convention back in 2006, and I met a lady um, who said she was from Mars Hill. You know, for all the names I remember, I, I, I was surprised that I didn't get this lady's name down who gave me the bones. And um, she saw the way I was playing the guitar and the way I played it very rhythmically, and she thought that I needed to learn the bones, and she told me that I should learn because they're part of the tradition, and I should make that a part of my repertoire. And so she showed me how to play them, and then I've just taken them with me since. And um, I've gotten to meet a lot of different bones players over time. You know, um, it's like a, it's its own secret society of bones. There's even, there actually is a rhythm bone society as well that's all dedicated to bones players from all over the world. And, and it's amazing, the, the camaraderie that can come through bones playing. It's just really interesting, uh, you know. And so I didn't know when I started the instrument that it would take me into this much bigger world of, of bones playing that is a worldwide network. And um, so I was just really kind of blown away that, that the bones started to, one, take me into a bigger world of music, but then two, um, it took me full circle personally, because as I mentioned before, I started out percussion in grade school. So my, my time in playing the whole pit orchestra from the timpani down to the suspended cymbal, I was able to take a lot of those sort of elements in percussion and bring that to old time music through the bones. Um, I do a little bit of that also through the jug and I'll play drums here and there on certain songs, but um, just to be able to bring that sort of interesting syncopated percussive element to, to string band music in a, in a modern context was very exciting and exhilarating for me because a lot of uh, old time music in its traditional sense they didn't tend to have a lot of percussion because the well it didn't record well for one and then two the bones are extremely loud and even to go into the studio now with the bones i have to be very selective with how i do the bones or else it can be very very loud coming back in into the microphone so the bones kind of got got taken out of old time music uh, once you started to have recorded music in the early 1920s. Um, but it was part of the American popular diaspora going all the way up into the 1940s and 1960s. Um, the, um, there was a musician by the name of Freeman Davis who went by the name of Brother Bones and he was the mascot for the Harlem Globetrotters. And his version of Sweet Georgia Brown is the best known bone song of all time. He whistled and he played four bones in each hand. And so that sweet Georgia Brown that you hear distinctively with the Harlem Globetrotters is a Bones player. And so it's this really interesting sort of diaspora of percussion that then it goes beyond Bones, it goes into any type of percussion, washboard, and it goes into a jug, it goes into tambourine, and it goes into all these, you know, these sort of, all these other side roads of percussive instruments that you find, some homemade, some more, um, more consciously made, uh, whether they were like an instrument from uh, outside of the United States adapted into the United States culture or some variation of that. Um, yeah, once I started getting into that world, it, it just it just started to it started to just uh, bowl over, and then all of a sudden, you know, being one of the few people interested in this 
particular aspect of old time music. I've just collected masses of recordings of different groups that feature percussion and and have just studied that and studied what does it mean you know when you play an Irish tune like what type of rhythm do you play when you play a bluesy number what sort of rhythm should you play and it it turned into a whole other study of the music on a rhythmic beat pattern which is something that fiddlers and banjos and guitar players don't really do in a string band they kind of do their parts and usually old time music is played in full unison but when you're playing percussion you can't really play unison because you're not playing notes but rhythmic patterns you can add um, a habanero you can do um, a lot of times there's a there's one rhythm that goes but in a string band, you have la 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 da 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 You have a little sort of a habanera pattern that goes within most standard string band rhythm, but you have to kind of adapt. You have to kind of adjust it, pull some beats out of it, squeeze some beats together on it, and and it, and so from the bones, I was able to start going on a whole journey that took me on this very multifaceted uh, exploration of the music beyond the. The notes and the melodies but the rhythmic patterns that also kind of fit within it because of course um you know most square dance music is a big collective environment so you kind of get a, a sense of how you know if everybody lands on the one or you know that some of the rules of jamming is start right start together end together and just to be able to do that it takes a lot of um planning and it takes a lot of discipline to know when those things are going to happen. And it seems like a, a simple thing to do, but once you play enough square dances, and especially if you've got really good dancers in front of you that know the difference, you really got to have those things sharp and ready to go, because dancers will just stand at a square dance and just say, this music sounds good, but we can't dance, you know? Yeah. And, and in some ways, other music doesn't really, it's not so demanding as square dance music can be just because um, you really have to play for yeah. the dancers without much improvisation, because even, yeah. even as a string band player, you can't improvise too much. It's mostly unison. So as a percussionist, you have to kind of figure that area between creating a little excitement for the general sound, but also a little excitement that's outside of the, the unison flavor that's part of everything else. But that's a, that's a long answer for a, <laughs> for a short question on the bones there. Though. I like that, I like that. <laughs> yeah, music can get can get so complex and it's so easy to lose sight of that it it from just casual listening it's just it sounds like this it sounds like and then you have no clue that it's that difficult to really lock in as a player well that's one of the that's one of the our jobs as players when we're on the stage is to make the music tell you all these things without us having to explain it to you literally because of course um, you know if we only got three and a half minutes to make it happen it's um, <laughs> You, we we got to get to the music and, and get people jumping. And, and then, of course, these are all more footnotes for after the dance. If you say, why did I like that song so much? Then all of a sudden you can ask the fiddler, where's that song from? And then they might tell you something that may be... I found sometimes, you know, my ear has gotten good enough to where I'll pull something of interest out of a song, and I won't even know that's connected somehow to something I was thinking about or listening or something and and a lot of times music can take you on those journeys too hmm. dom what is in the near future for you what are you doing oh wow well this in the next uh, couple of weeks i have a new single coming out um, um before uh before the big shutdown happened uh, this year um in december of 2019 i was touring with Reverend Peyton's big damn band uh, <laughs> they're a lot of fun oh boy they've been they've been good friends of mine since 2007 we um, we met over at the Joshua Tree Festival and we just became good friends and Rev and Breezy and I um, have talked for years about doing something together and uh, last year I got to co-host the Blues Hall of Fame ceremony for the Blues Foundation and I got to induct the song Shake Your Moneymaker by Elmore James into the Hall of Fame so it was a really great moment and then so now serendipity comes in and during the actual Blues Awards ceremony, uh, Rev had decided to do Shake Your Money Makers, the big Ender Jam. And he brought a little 1952 Supra, just like Elmore James played on his original recording. And so we got into a big jam. It was like a big 15 minute jam, seven harmonica players, three horns, 
And in the rhythm section, you had little Stevie Van Zandt, Rev Payton, and Steve Cropper just wailing in the rhythm section. And so... That, that'll do, if, yeah, you, if you have to, Exactly. Right? And so I was, <laughs> I was singing the vocals in the front, but I looked back and I saw the way that the three of them were jamming. And unfortunately, we weren't able to get little Stevie to join us during the actual session. But I got together with Rev after that, that um, end of the night jam and said, let's get together at Sun Records and do that. Let's just do that single. And so about two or three weeks later, we got together with the, all the our people and uh, we decided to book a session over at the old Sun Records, 706 Union Avenue. And... Uh, we got to go in there with Cropper and Rev and got to get their sound together. Uh, on bass we had the wonderful Scott Sutherland who just was putting down some beautiful bass and uh, had the, the big damn band uh, and Washboard Breezy and uh, Sad Max on the drums. And uh, yeah, and then I was singing it and playing some bones. So that's coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, and that was a beautiful bit of serendipity for that one. I just had a, an album, uh, or not an album, but a, a wax cylinder come out. Uh, I did a wax cylinder of one of the songs from Prospect Hill. Um, now, uh, wait a minute. How many of those are you going to make? Well, we made 20 of them, so it's a very limited run. Because I know people that collect cylinders, and that, if you think about bones as being esoteric, I mean, come on. Well, it was funny. We did 20 because I wasn't sure how many we'd actually sell. Because, of course, it is a very esoteric form of m media. I was surprised to find that there were hundreds of people that reached out that said they wanted a wax cylinder. I know one already. I mm -hmm. just, right off the bat, I know somebody that would buy it. And then, and, and what's funny, too, universities wanted to build a new section. Because a lot of the universities have wax cylinder collections, but they haven't put a new one into their collection in a hundred years so when I put this thing out I had a lot of interest from the universities as well saying oh we want to have that in the archives so I'm gonna I gotta figure out some way to do it again because it wasn't necessarily hard to make the cylinders but there was so much interest that I hope to do it again um, let's see that was a, a big one that came out Prospect Hill being reissued was a big thing that happened this year I mean granted the, it came out on February 28th and then everything shut down basically the week afterward but um, I was thankful that I got through the whole project, production, in hand before everything went down. So that was good as, yeah. in, in, a, in one sense. So all the major creative stuff, I was able to get a lot of that done earlier in the year, which was good. Um, and then one other one that actually, just a final one, um, a little reissue, um, actually speaking of the idea of um, the early roots of country music, I did a, a reissue project called Proto Billy with um, the great record collectors Hank Sapoznik and Dick Spotswood. And a few years ago, uh, Dick Spotswood, he, um, he did um, a collection with Hank um, called uh, You Ain't Talking to Me on Charlie Poole's music. And one of the discs that Hank put together was a, a disc of cylinder recordings of songs that Charlie Poole recorded later on just to show that there was a correlation where Charlie Poole is reaching into a deeper well than just folk songs. He also had Tin Pan Alley, and mm -hmm. there are many direct recordings that you can correlate with players like Charlie Poole, who happened to have access to wax cylinders because of the, um, the urban boom of the cotton mills at that time. Um, and so this whole set, Proto Billy, takes that idea and expands it out to, um, I think it's a 80, nine different songs that are country music standards and, and brings different song, different cylinder recordings and also shellac 78 recordings of performers performing the same song going from the 1890s to the 20s to as far as the 1940s and I have a track on there too so it goes all the way to 2014 uh, for um, uh, one of the tracks on um, uh, My Money Never Runs Out so we compare that with the Gus Cannon track and then even the older two cylinder recordings that Gus Cannon uh, conglomerate together into the song My Money Never Runs Out. So it even goes into some of the details to that. So it's um, pretty amazing. Not just country, but also race records, uh, jazz, blues, and, um, and and spiritual music as well. It's really a beautiful set. So that was, those things came out and right as this year was coming through. So these are all things that are still uh, very current in my mind. Wow. Dom, it's been such a great pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for being here hey, on Southern Songs and Stories. Of course.